Hi everybody, welcome to our unit on how scientists measure. In ancient times, people used different units of measurement such as a hand span, a cubit, which is the length of the tip of the middle finger to the elbow, footstep, and arm length. These methods were not satisfactory because these units of measurements varied from person to person. For the sake of uniformity, scientists all over the world have accepted a set of standard units of measurements. This standard system of unit is known as the International System of Units, or the SI units for short. Under this system, there are seven fundamental units for physical quantities from which other units are derived. These are length, mass, time, electric current, temperature, amount of substance, and luminous intensity. Notice, the SI unit for length is meters, mass is kilograms, time is in seconds, electric current is in ampere, temperature is in kelvins, amount of substance is in moles, and luminous intensity is in candelas. Derived units are units which are derived from these fundamental units. Some examples include area, volume, density, etc. Today we will be focusing on how scientists measure length, mass, temperature, and volume. Length is measured as the distance between two points or objects. The standard unit of measurement of length is a meter and can be written as a lowercase m. There are many instruments used to measure length, a meter stick, measuring tape, ruler, etc. The type of instrument depends on the type of work and the accuracy that is needed. For example, a stiff meter stick would be used by carpenters and masons. A flexible measuring tape, however, would be used by tailors and a ruler for geometry work. In science class, most measurements are much smaller than a meter. A metric ruler is the standard instrument for measurement in the lab. Thus, it is important to understand how to measure and read a ruler. On a metric ruler, each individual line represents a millimeter and is written as two lowercase m's. Each millimeter is one-tenth of a centimeter, meaning that 10 millimeters make up one centimeter. So that means that the numbers on the ruler represent centimeters or cm. To report the length of an object, observe the numerical values of the marked lines at the end of the object. Then estimate the last digit by visually dividing the space between the smallest marked lines. Scientists understand that the last digit in a measurement is an estimate. This helps define the precision of the device being used to measure. For example, let's look at the first image. The end of the object is between 4 cm and 5 cm. Estimate that the end of the wooden object is halfway between the 4 cm and 5 cm mark. The value would then be reported as approximately 4.5 cm. Note that 4.5 cm is a more precise and accurate measurement of the object than if we simply said it's about 4 cm or it's about 5 cm. Now, let's look at the second image. The metric ruler is marked at every 0.1 cm or it's marked by millimeters. You can now estimate that the length is halfway between 4.5 centimeters and 4.6 centimeters. Thus, we can report the value as 4.55 centimeters. Note that this is an even more precise and accurate measurement of the object. Can you determine the length of the red line in centimeters? Before you get started, just note that there are 10 millimeters between each centimeter. That means that each individual line represents 0.1 centimeters. Since this goes to the tenths place, 0.1, we can estimate one space further than that. So you should be estimating to the hundredths place. Pause this video before continuing. The best answer is B, 9.03 centimeters. Mass is the amount of matter present in an object. Scientists often measure mass with a triple beam balance or an electronic balance. The figure on the right is an enlarged version of the scales of the triple beam balance. The middle scale, which measures the largest mass, reads 300 grams. This is followed by the top scale, which reads 30 grams. The bottom scale reads 5.0 grams. Therefore, the mass of the object in the pan is 335.0 grams. We found this by adding up 300 plus 30 plus 5. To measure very small masses, scientists use electronic balances. This type of balance makes it easier to make accurate measurements because mass is shown as a digital readout. Embedded is a video of how to use an electronic balance. In this video, you will learn how to use an electronic balance. 
There are different types of electronic balances depending upon the purpose and accuracy desired. Balances have ranges from whole grams to tenths, hundreds, thousands, and ten thousandths of a gram. To start using an electronic balance, first turn on the power button. The balance will zero itself. Next, place a clean weigh boat on the balance. And when the reading has steadied, set the balance to zero with the weigh boat. Using a spatula, slowly add the material that you are weighing into the weigh boat. Continue to add material until you reach the amount of the material that you want. Once material is removed from the stock bottle, any excess should not be returned into the bottle. This prevents contaminating the source. A thermometer is a tool or instrument used to measure temperature and should be handled with care. To use a thermometer, remember the following. Consider what unit your thermometer is measuring in. Is it in Celsius or Fahrenheit? To read the temperature, your eyes should be level with the liquid in the thermometer. Be sure to determine the increment of the scale. Just like when we measure the length of an object, scientists estimate the last digit by visually dividing the space between the smallest marked lines. This helps define the precision of the device being used to measure. First, let's determine the increment of the scale. Notice that each line is going up by a value of 2 degrees Celsius. Thus, we can say that the liquid in the thermometer is halfway between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius. The value would be represented as 37 0.0 degrees Celsius. Since we know this thermometer measures to the ones place, we will estimate one decimal place value further to the tenths place. Thus, we say 37.0. Note that 37.0 degrees is more precise than simply saying 37, 36, or 38. Volume is the space occupied by an object. At home, you might measure the volume of a liquid with a measuring cup. In science, the volume of a liquid might be measured with a graduated cylinder, like the one sketched on the left. The graduated cylinder in the picture has a scale in milliliters, with a maximum volume of 100 milliliters. Note that there are varying sizes of graduated cylinders with different increments as well. Follow these steps when using a graduated cylinder. First, place the graduated cylinder on a level surface before adding the water. After adding the liquid, move so that your eyes are at the same level as the top of the liquid in the graduated cylinder. Read the mark on the glass that is at the lowest point of the curved surface of the liquid. This point is called the meniscus. To read a graduated cylinder, you must know the value of each measuring line. For example, in a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, there are 10 subgraduates between 50 and 60. Therefore, the value of each subgraduate is 1 milliliter. Let's look at another example. In this example of a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder, there are 10 subgraduates or 10 smaller lines between the 6 milliliter and the 8 milliliter mark. To determine the value of each subgraduate, first let's find the difference between 6 and 8 milliliters. When you subtract 6 from 8, you get 2 milliliters. That means that the 10 subgraduates should be equivalent to 2 milliliters. Thus, we can divide 2 milliliters by 10 subgraduates. 2 divided by 10 equals to 0 0.2. That just means that each subgraduate or measuring line has a value of 0.2 milliliters. Just like when we measure the length and temperature, scientists estimate the last digit by visually dividing the space between the smallest marked lines. This means that we estimate one decimal place past the smallest scale division inscribed on the graduated cylinder. In this case, if each line increases by 0.2 milliliters, which is in the tenths place, we should be estimating the final digit to the hundredths place. So the digit will be one digit more accurate than what the cylinder displays. Let's practice reading the graduated cylinders. Pay attention to the numbers and graduations between each. Remember to include your estimated digit. We can see that the value of each subgraduate is one milliliter. Read the mark on the glass that is at the lowest point of the curved surface of the liquid, or meniscus. We can see then that the volume of the cylinder is 56.0 milliliters. What about this one? Go ahead and pause this video before continuing on. 
First, you should have identified the value of each subgraduate. Note that there are 10 subgraduates between 4 milliliters and 5 milliliters. To find the value of each subgraduate, first find the difference between 4 and 5 milliliters. So 5 minus 4 equals to 1. Then you will divide 1 by the 10 subgraduates. So 1 divided by 10 is just 1 tenth or 0 0.1. That means that each subgraduate equals to 0 0.1. Then, remember we will measure the volume at the liquid's meniscus, or lowest point. Remember to include your estimated digit in the hundredths place. We can see that the volume in the cylinder is about 4.30 milliliters. When we talk about measuring volume, it is important to differentiate how the volume of a regular versus irregular object is measured. First, let's define a regular object. A regular object has faces that are standard polygons. For example, a cube has six square faces and thus would be considered a regular object. A triangular prism consists of two triangular faces and three rectangular faces. Triangles and rectangles are all standard polygons, thus a triangular prism is also a regular object. The volume of a regular object can be measured simply using a formula. For example, the volume of a cube is found by multiplying its length by its width by its height. What about an irregular object? Irregular objects are those which do not have standard polygons for faces, such as a paper clip, a screw, or a rock. A method called water displacement can be used to measure the volume of an irregular object. Suppose we want to measure the volume of a rock using water displacement. First, we will fill a graduated cylinder with water and measure its initial volume. If we put the rock in the graduated cylinder, you will see that the water levels will rise. The amount that the water level rises is equal to the amount of water that was displaced. Record your final measurement. Some people jump to the conclusion that the final volume is equal to the volume of the object, but that would be incorrect. The amount of water that was displaced is equal to the volume of the object. So in order to find the volume of the object, first you have to find the difference between the final and initial readings. Make sure that the volume that you calculate makes sense. Some obvious signs of mistakes are things like your object having a negative volume. Let's look at an example. The initial volume of our graduated cylinder is said to be 50 milliliters. When the rock was placed inside of the cylinder, the water levels rose to 75 milliliters. That means that the amount of water displaced is equal to the volume of our rock. Therefore, if we find the difference between our final and initial readings, we see that the volume of the rock is equal to 75 milliliters minus 50 milliliters, which equals to 25.0 milliliters. Again, I found that every line on this graduated cylinder went up by ones, so I went ahead and estimated that last digit in the tenths place to 25.0 whenever I recorded my final volume. And that concludes our video on how scientists measure. Thanks guys, see you guys next time, bye!